So we're here today at UC Davis Institute of Transportation Studies. Thanks to our hosts. Let's give them a round of applause. And we're going to be talking about the transformation of mobility with none other than Dan Sperling, who's the, the founder of UC Davis ITS. And we're going to be hearing from Dan pretty soon. But before we go there, I just want to give a little bit of background on the Cleaner Air Partnership for those of you guys who, who might be new to these conversations. Um, so the, the Cleaner Air Partnership is a coalition of business groups, nonprofits, and government entities who basically work together to advance cleaner air in that six county Sacramento region. We've been around since 1986, so that's a long time. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're like, yeah. <laughs> 1986? Yeah, yeah, I blew my mind, man. Um, but it was founded by, by the Sacramento Metro Chamber in Greece, California. So a long legacy of cleaner advocacy and work in, in Sacramento region. Um, and just want to give a shout out to our sponsors, and then I'm going to turn it over to some housekeeping and then Dan. So um, thank you to our host, UC Davis ITS, but also the SAC Metro Air District, Tiger, SMUD, Sutter Health, the Sacramento Association of Realtors, the Placer County Air Pollution Control District, Yola Solano Air Quality Management District, PG&E, the El Dorado County Air Quality Management District, Semex, Clarity, and Nicola Motors. So thank you all. Let's give them a round.
And then a little housekeeping. So those of you who came on, I guess, sustainable transportation modes, thank you. You guys get a gold star. Those of you who maybe didn't or were halfway there with like a UV, um, as long as you guys parked in the, I think it's the WV staff parking, you're good. They won't ticket you. Um, and then don't park under a solar panel. Park under a solar panel, that's bad too. Those are for residents of the West Village area. When I was going to school here, they were still building this. So it's really cool to see it like fully built out. Uh, in this way it's supposed to be like a green sustainable kind of area right so except for the fountain um so so restrooms are around it's like a horseshoe as, as, as you guys described so you go out that door and then around and follow the signs um food has been provided by uc davis dining service I'm, you guys nailed it oh my god wow, so good great so good so those of you on on the, the zoom sorry <laughs> <laughs> next time maybe um and then for trash. So the salt, who's the who's the trash expert here? Yeah. You just, I'm the trash expert. Okay. <laughs> we have a bin out here for the recycling, like for the plates and the cords, and the other one for the trash. Fantastic. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> um, so what, what I do want to do next is do a quick round of intros around the room. We're not going to do it with the Zoom folks, um, but that way we at least kind of know who, who from the region is in the room with us today. I already said Adrian Ren from Valley Vision. Why don't we start with JC? Hi everyone, my name is Juan Carlos Garcia. I'm a policy analyst here at Chicago ITS. Yes. Hi everyone, I'm Laurel Smith. I'm a project associate at Valley Vision. Hi everyone, I'm Rosanna Herber. I'm the vice president on the SMUD board. I'm Greg Fishman, also a member of the SMUD board of directors and my day job is with Sacramento Regional Transit. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sara Parahali. I am part of the Office of Climate Action and Sustainability at the City of Sacramento. Hello, I'm Alberto Ayala with the SAC Metro uh, District. That is my day job and my night job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi everybody, my name is Isaac Gonzalez and I'm an active uh, transportation commissioner with the City of Sacramento. Sophia Afikova, policy advocate with the Coalition for Clean Air. Uh, Eric White with the Placer County Air District. Paul Hensley with the Yolo Solano Air Quality Management District. Christian Bennett, I'm the new director of Yolo Solano Air District. Sarah Clark, City of Sacramento Office of Climate Action and Sustainability. Excuse me, Willie, the future. Jared Lancaster, Air Quality, Climate Change, and uh, Health Risk Analyst at uh, ICF Consulting. Brian Donnelly, the Department of Curve Communications. Deb Banks, Executive Director of Sacramento Area Bicycle Lab. It's awesome that transportation commissioner for Sacramento and a swab. Susie Pegg, I'm a research faculty here at ITS, and I direct our Canada Research Center. I'm Molly Cognacino. I'm also at ITS Davis. Um, we're lucky to have a policy lead and also executive director of the Center of the Mobility Science Automation and Education Center for the same. Brian Harold, I'm a program evaluation specialist here at ITS Davis. All right, this is Baraha's faculty here at UC Davis. I do research on environmental justice. Hello everyone, I'm Gail Brosman. I'm a program planner with Sacramento County Public Health, and I work with Adrian uh, at, as part of the vehicle emissions uh, grant. Uh, Valley Vision is one of our subcontractors. Hi everyone, I'm Will Explore, the Director of Small Business for the California Black Tech Work Conference. I'm, I'm Stephanie Allward, I'm Sacramento County Airports uh, Planning and Environment. Taylor, Senior Airport Planner, Sacramento County Department of Airports, and also the chair of the 50 quarter TMA. Morris Lam, I'm on the advisory committee to the Clean Transportation Program of the California Energy Commission. I'm Cassandra Cortez, I'm a transportation planner with the City of Sacramento and the Department of Public Works. I'm Ralph Cropper. Yeah, in 1986, I helped start the Mineral Partnerships Clean Fuels Task Force, but now I'm uh, uh, with the Environmental Council of Sacramento and Breathe California Sacramento. Hi there, I'm Sue Taranishi. I'm a board member of Breathe California and uh, also the Sacramento Area Vice Collectives. Uh, Victoria Vasquez, I am the Grants and Public Policy Manager for California Relief and I chair the City of Sacramento Parks and Community Enrichment Commission. 
Good afternoon, Chris Baker, AB 617 committee member and uh, chair of oversight commission in Sacramento County. Good afternoon, Gary Bradford, Yuba County Supervisor representing the Plumas Lake and Wheatland areas. Good afternoon, Dr. Kierke, Catherine O'Haven, um, we're consultant. Fantastic. We'll get to you next. You got, you got an intro, but um, just want to give a quick roadmap of this event. So we're going to do 20 minutes of remarks from Mr. Sperling. Um, very interested in kind of what you have to share with us in the context of the Sacramento region. And then we're going to have about 40 minutes for discussion. And so I want you guys thinking about questions for Dan, taking advantage of this time that we have in the room with Dan, um, and, and just having a good conversation about how we see mobility transforming in our region. Okay, so those of you guys who are on Zoom, um, please enter your questions in the chat. We'll probably be popping over to you guys uh, with other pertinent questions you'll have. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to you. And let's, you know, if you want to start by introducing yourself, but also what ITS does. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming here. This is amazing. All, you know, all these leaders and experts and all the people that are making things happen in the Sacramento area, all here in one room. So great to see you all here. Um, so I'm Dan Sperling. So I'm a professor here at UC Davis, and I'm director of the Institute of Transportation Studies. And, and yes, I did start it. And yes, it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was a teenager when I started it. <laughs> 35 years ago or so. <laughs> um, so, and and I guess part of my bio is I would serve as, on the, as a board member for the Air Resources Board for 16 years until this past January. A few folks here from CARB that uh, I am well acquainted with from my history at CARB. So, um, <clears throat> Let me, oh, okay, another about the con here, you know, the, this layout here. So the, the Institute of Transportation Studies and the Energy Efficiency Institute, Energy and Efficiency Institute, we have basically all the offices starting there and going all the way around the uh, plaza here. So we've gotten quite big. The Institute is now, has, ITS itself has almost 200 people. And now half of them are graduate students working as research assistants. So over 100 graduate students here affiliated with ITS. And then, and then we have our research staff, our faculty, you know, some of them you met here, Susie, Jesus, Brian. Uh, so it's, a pretty, it's become a pretty big operation. And we really, uh, you know, I'm really proud to have been able to lead it all these times because it really has grown to be the leading. Okay, we say this and it sounds really kind of outrageous over the top, but um, we say it with a straight face now that we are the leading university based sustainable transportation center in the world. You know, I always used to say, you know, that's a little over the top, but. <laughs> We, we have housed and we won the National Center for Sustainable Transportation. We've had that here. We've won it three times now from the US DOT. So we've had that since 2013. And now we have centers in China, India, uh, Europe, uh, and a, a, a growing program in Mexico. So I figured, and it's all focused on sustainable transportation, you know, broadly defined. So I feel like comfortable. Okay, I can say it, you know, without you remember Al Gore a number of years ago, he said he founded the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Not that. <laughs> so we do have a big program here. We have centers and uh, so we have that national center, which is actually leading. We have various other universities that are partners with it. Uh, Riverside, USC, Georgia Tech, Vermont. And, and we have a lot of centers and programs here. So we have centers on electric, really big one on electric vehicles. Uh, we have on freight, on bicycling. We have one on um, brain freeze here. We have so many, I lose track of them. Uh, and so, you know, pavements, 
So we really have a broad range. Like even pavements, we focus on how do you get new sustainable materials and do it in a more sustainable way. So that really is the theme when we founded this institute some 30 plus years ago, that was the theme. And when at that point, the word sustainable and transportation just didn't exist. You know, I, I was on a committee in Washington, D.C. in the early 90s. And this was revolutionary <laughs> to talk about sustainable transportation. What is it? But now it's become very mainstream, of course. And so everyone's imitating us, but we were there first. Um, so we have uh, lots of faculty and researchers. And I do want to say, you know, as I launch into this, is that we have lots of partnerships with Sacramento and with you know, other areas in the region. And we really are committed to really strengthening those because the what's really unique and distinct about our institute is it's very engaged with the outside community, with governments, with NGOs, community groups, industry. And right from the beginning, that's been kind of our part of our DNA that we've done this. So, you know, it's great seeing you all here. We have done some joint proposals. We have joint projects. Some of our faculty and students are involved in various things, but we really want to make that even bigger and better in the future. So any ideas you have for partnerships, you know, we work with SACOG and the city, Sacramento, lots of other stuff. Okay. So um, let me frame this discussion about transportation by saying this is a really a pivotal time in the history of transportation. And so, you know, I do have a lot of history here <laughs> in transportation and it's evolved tremendously. Yeah, you know, for many, actually for many decades, probably when from the time the interstate highway system was launched and well on its way in the early 60s until maybe 10 years ago, there was really very little innovation, very little system change. Cars were basically the same. Cars were safer and lower emitting, but functionally the same. Buses were the same. Transit was the same. Roads the same. There wasn't much innovation. There wasn't much change. But that started changing about 10, about 10 12 years ago. So we, you know, and so I wrote this book and I know people have referred to it here, Three Revolutions. And that's what this is all about. This was four or five years ago. And it was the idea that, okay, transportation is really changing. You know, partly there was political, social pressures. You know, we, we had been interested in air pollution for a while, especially in California, but then climate became a big issue. And then social justice, environmental justice has become, you know, a big interest and concern and force in the last, you know, I say climate change in the last 10 to 15 years, environmental justice, social justice, probably five to 10 years. And so you couple that with some of the innovations on the technology side. And so we had electric vehicles become a thing around 2010. So 12, 10, 12 years ago, 15 years ago. And that's been moving along. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the iPhone came in 2007, and then a few years later came Uber and Lyft. And the whole idea that we could really do demand responsive transportation app based, you know, we've been trying to, you know, the transportation community have been trying to do that way back to the 70s, dial a ride. And it really all failed until you know the phone iPhone came along and smartphones came along. So then you have the shared, then you have that shared mobility, then we had the shared bikes, shared scooters come in, and then kind of on the horizon, it's been on the horizon for a number of years, is the whole idea of automation, automated vehicles. And I'll tell you, okay, here's my bottom line. <laughs> and I do want, as we talk along here, I think you should feel free to jump in with questions along the way. Is that, is that okay? Totally fine. Yeah, this is interactive. So I'm going to tell you my bottom line conclusions, and then we, some of you will get upset, some of you will get <laughs> motivated. Um, 
that you know some you know we if it would just put it in terms of the three revolutions for instance okay electrification that's happening big time you know car me and a few other people here you know we designed those regulations and 2035 100 percent of all vehicles light duty vehicle sales are going to have to be zero emission uh, on the freight side just passed a new rule that all trucks all trucks must be zero emitting by 2036. now that i'm not on the cardboard i can comment on that a little <laughs> <laughs> ain't gonna happen <laughs> but it's a real what i learned from mary nichols who was you know my boss for many years i learned from mary if you're going to do something big you've got to put out a big goal you got to put a stake in the ground and maybe you won't get there but you know when you do these big changes you get so many institutions and organizations and people that have to coalesce around it big changes don't happen through a single regulation for instance or a governor's executive order that's not how change happens and so that stake in the ground so i think the light duty evs i'm pretty sure we'll get pretty close to that 100 percent in 2035 trucks i'm not so sure you know there was kind of a political deal made to, it was originally proposed to be 2040 or 2042 some political deals were not deals but um, compromises were made to bring it to 2036. that's going to be a really tough sell it's really important we're going to eventually get there but um and we should do everything we can and it's important to have that target and that goal um, but that'll be a little slower so that's part of it so at the end of the day so electrification is happening the sharing has really fallen apart it's been it's i won't quite call it a disaster or failure but you know transit ridership is way down um, even on the on the TNCs at Uber and Lyft, Lyft has said they're not going to do uh, pooling or multiple rides in their vehicles anymore. Uber said they will, but they're not doing it in Sacramento. They're, they're starting starting it, restarting it in just five cities, I believe. I don't know which ones, but I guess it's you know, the Bay Area, LA, and a few others. Um, you know, Davis banned shared scooters. <laughs> I, it's a mistake, but okay. Uh, but you know, the, so the, the shared bikes and, and the use of scooter, you see here a lot of a lot of students are using scooters now, but they're they're buying them. Um, so you got the micro what we call micro mobility, the bikes and the scooters that's coming along pretty well. The transit's not happening, the TNCs uh, problem. Uh, and so, you know, that's where we're struggling. So where I, if we looking at big change, you know, there's a lot of little things and a lot of, most of you are working on all these little things we can do, you know, more bike paths and, and somehow figuring out something with transit to keep it, you know, functioning and, and effective. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we've got some major challenges. We create such a car centric transportation system that it's really marginalized a lot of people and we don't talk about that you know there's the people that have physical limitations there's people that are economic you know limitations and so i'm jumping ahead but i had a quote that i'm going to use so there was an article in the new york times a few days ago about um really these innovative idea innovative transportation options and they focused a lot on the, on the valley here. And there was a quote from uh, Ray Leon, mayor of Huron in the valley. And he said, owning a car is a poverty perpetuator. And that's not something idea we don't hear. We just hear, we've got to get electric vehicles into the disadvantaged communities and, and you know make it available. And that's important, but I think what, we're not addressing, which is really important, is you know, the large number of people, and you know, a lot of people 
have a car, like a family has a car, but it's an old car, it's not reliable, you have multiple people that are working and going to school and, and aren't getting good accessibility and mobility. And you know, I've come up with just a crude number. I keep waiting for one of our brilliant students or faculty to nail this number, but you know, I'm thinking something like 20% of our population is really seriously disadvantaged because they don't have uh, good mobility and accessibility. So that's not a scientifically based number yet. Maybe Jesus back there. That's a good project for Jesus. He's out there. So when I look at it, I only see one really promising option to really create a much more sustainable transportation in addition to electrification, you know, in terms of the sharing. And it is the automation part of it. And it's pretty controversial, but you know, if we have shared automated vehicles, you can provide accessibility to a lot more people at much less cost than public transport, you know, public transportation as we know it uh, provides. And, and so you're providing, it's a equity strategy, it's an economic strategy, as well as an environmental strategy, because you're reducing, you know, you're getting people to share rides. And so it's a complement, obviously, to public transportation. So I'm kind of veering off of what I was going to tell you, but I, this is what gets me motivated. You know, public, and this is where I get in trouble. <laughs> I know we got RT here, but now that I'm not on the board, uh, now I don't report to the governor or anyone. <laughs> you know, public transportation serves one to two percent of our passenger miles uh, in California in this in this country. It's much more obviously in downtown San Francisco. It's even somewhat more in you know downtown Sacramento, but overall. It's not, you know, we have that 20% number and we're saying we're serving, you know, 1%, 1.5% from public transportation. That means there's a whole lot of people that are not being served well. So, you know, that's why I come back, you know, shared automated vehicles, you know, I know Molly was just at a PUC hearing where in San Francisco, the official community in San Francisco is against automated vehicles, autonomous. I say automated because autonomous is the wrong word. You know, autonomous was developed by the Silicon Valley people, it's Google. They said, our vehicles are going to be autonomous in the sense we don't need anyone else or anything else. It doesn't have to be connected to traffic lights, other cars. We're just gonna bring out our little autonomous cars. And, and so they called it autonomous, but these vehicles have to be connected you know, other vehicles to the infrastructure. And so they're not autonomous, right? It, it violates the English language, but it's, a <laughs> but it's a lost cause. So, you know, you can keep saying autonomous and I won't be offended, uh, but I do call them automated. So they're, because they're automated and connected. So here we are, you know, it's so like in San Francisco, they're all upset because the cars are stopping you know, and, and for unknown reasons in the middle of an intersection occasionally or there, but there've been, you know, no major crashes, you know, no, no injuries, no fatalities. So there, but, you know, in San Francisco, they get upset about a lot of things, right? And <laughs> so it, it's been a little controversial uh, in terms of the future of automated vehicles, but the industry keeps pumping a lot of money into it. It is going to happen. Uh, it's going to unfold in different ways. And, and I just look at it. I say, I don't see any other big ideas of really making transportation really sustainable, you know, especially from an equity perspective and a, an environmental perspective uh, and an economic perspective beyond electrification. So that's my big so. Um, so, you, you know. Let me talk about a few things, but now you know what I think big picture. So, um, you know, so I should talk about the shared mobility, the sharing part of this, 
which I think is really crucial. So there are various ideas. The other one I didn't mention is microtransit. That's the idea that it's basically a, a vehicle bigger than a car, a van or a small bus that is demand responsive app-based. So in the Sacramento area, the company Via in West Sacramento and some other places has been operating this service, but it's heavily subsidized, you know, like conventional transit. And okay, here's another controversial part of that is that when Via started out, they were a very entrepreneurial company that they were going to revolutionize public transportation. And they found, especially in the US, but I think, you know, in many other places, they couldn't succeed that way because, you know, one, we fund, we finance transportation in a way that money, like on the transit side, it's very dedicated, goes to the operator. And operators are not very um, enthusiastic about sharing that money that is dedicated to them. We've got the unions you know that want to make sure that you know everything's union jobs and so it ends up they just couldn't participate in, in you know as an independent uh, entrepreneurial company so they mostly what they do is they contract themselves you know to rt or you know la metro and they provide the service on contract you know and you lose a lot of entrepreneurial parts of that as a result. So the microtransit has really not gone very far and probably in its current form, unless it's automated or something, unless it's automated or some other kind of institutional structure comes about, it's not really gonna grow, but it's a great concept. Okay, so, you know, we're doing in transportation, we're doing a lot better. I mean, as I said, it's, you know, I tell our graduate students, this is the best time ever that you could be in this field. 20 years ago, it was really rather boring. You know, we didn't think so at the time, but in comparison, so much is happening now and all these things I'm talking about. This is all new and it's exciting and with the potential for really providing a lot of improvement. So um, relating this to Sacramento area, um, you know, I talked about the via and the micro transit, you know, Sacramento has, you know, has all of these pieces. And, you know, the question becomes, how can we push forward, you know, in, in making it more sustainable? So on the electrification side, bike infrastructure, you know, supporting the use of bikes and scooters, figuring out how to make transit, I mean, one, how to keep transit alive, but even better, how to expand it. And are there partnerships you know, that can be created or, you know, between, you know, once you get, because, you know, the, the thing about transit is it works really well in dense areas and on dense corridors. But, you know, most of our country is not in dense areas or dense corridors. And so that's where we struggle. And that's why the use of transit is so low. We haven't figured out a model to make it work in rural, you know, never mind rural areas, even suburban areas. Um, maybe I should stop there. I know we can talk about, you know, there's lots of issues. Oh, maybe fuels and hydrogen. Okay. So, you know, fuels is a really interesting one because we're going to electrify for sure. And, but there's going to be a lot of, we'll call them legacy vehicles on the road for a very long time, cars and trucks. And, and so where it is, are we going to just stick with gasoline and diesel and diesel for that? Or are we going to work towards more sustainable fuels? So there is renewable, the, the big, We've had ethanol for a while made from corn and, and depending on how you look at it, you know, it's, you know, on the, on the one side, it, 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 they have gotten innovative and they've reduced the carbon footprint. It used to be corn ethanol was 
almost like gasoline in terms of greenhouse gases you know, per unit of energy. Now it's probably about 40, uh, on average, 35, 40% better than gasoline. So that's good. Air pollution effects are about the same, uh, but you're using massive amounts of land for it. Uh, we've kind of stabilized that in the US. I think we're not gonna see much more ethanol from corn, but what we're now seeing is um, what's known as renewable diesel. So there's two refineries in the Bay Area that are converting from being oil refineries to being renewable diesel refineries. And you know, they said they were going to use waste materials, you know, everything from waste McDonald's French fry oil to tallow uh, and a lot of others, but there's just not that much of it. They were sucking it in from around California, been sucking it in from around the world. And but it's limited. So what they're really going to be using is soybeans to make so oil from soybeans. And so then you get back to the same land issues. And eventually, if it keeps growing, you are going to be cutting down parts of the Amazon for sure but to plant more of this. So it's a little, you know, it's got pros and cons. And frankly, there aren't very many good options for liquid fuel. So that's kind of one of them. Another one is what we call e-fuels. And that's taking carbon dioxide either from the air or that's sequestered or captured and with hydrogen, combined with hydrogen made renewably. And you have a zero carbon fuel, but it's really expensive. So in Europe, they're actually doing it more seriously than in this country. So actually, if you want to hear anything, like I told you, we have senators in India, Mexico, China, uh, Europe. If you want to hear the larger context, happy to talk about that. So I think that um, frames it. There's lots, as you can tell, there's lots to talk about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there are. And thanks for addressing. So, so when you guys uh, filled out the form, uh, several of you guys submitted questions. And so Dan addressed a few of those in, in his remarks, but one of them is about hydrogen and you didn't really comment yet on like efficacy. So if you want to go there and then we'll jump into the rest of the comments. Yeah, hydrogen is a fascinating topic. I actually wrote a book on it 15 years ago. <laughs> so it's been around George Bush. George Bush II was a big proponent of hydrogen. He actually came out here and blessed it in Sacramento at the California Fuel Cell Partnership when he was president. Um, okay. And I was actually chair of the California Fuel Cell Partnership about 10 years ago. Okay, fast forward to 2023. It's pretty clear that batteries are going to dominate with light duty vehicles, cars, even our SUVs, and so on. So the question is, do we need hydrogen for cars? And the answer is probably not. But you know, remember what I said about those targets and getting there? You know, some of our researchers here, Gil Tao, that's up our TV research center, about a year ago, he started saying, you know, the first 50% is going to be pretty easy. You know, no one was saying that. He said, it's the last 20%, 30%. That's going to be really hard. Just think about, it. you know, there's some people that are just politicized to think, you know, EVs are you know, bad or politically. Um, remember, they used to, yeah, anyway. <laughs> And then you start looking at live in apartment buildings and multi unit dwellings. And it's going to be pretty hard to provide good service, good charging for all of them. And there's a lot of effort going into it. And, you know, we here are working a lot on it, but it's going to be hard. So it might be that that last 20% will be some combination of plug-in hybrids, which do have a small combustion engine, and maybe some hydrogen cars, like duty vehicles. 
And I'm just saying, you know, that last, you know, it's going to be hard getting 100%. Putting all our eggs in one basket is a little risky and a little challenging. Then we get into the truck side. And really, in some ways, it's the same discussion. Batteries are going to dominate through for most trucks. But the one area where they're problematic is for long haul uh, big trucks, you know, those big tractor trailers. And so, you know, Tesla has made a tractor trailer electric, but they built, they keep promising they're going to roll it out. I think they rolled out 12 and said they're not really going to focus on it for another year and a half uh, or so. Um, but it's going to be really, you know, because you got to carry a massive amount of batteries. They're expensive. They take up space. Um, and so a lot of the thinking is hydrogen might be really good for those big long haul trucks. So that's kind of the thinking. Now, I think that that's kind of the dominant thinking. Maybe hydrogen will be used a little bit in some short haul planes, maybe a little bit in some ships. So there's a role for hydrogen. California is going big time into hydrogen. We just put a proposal together for the state of California for a billion dollars from the federal government for a hydrogen hub. And there's another couple, and then the state is throwing it, promising another big chunk of money, something approaching a billion dollars. And then industry is promising another couple billion dollars or so on top of that. And so this is hydrogen, not just for transportation, but for storing electrons, storing electricity, because you know, with that, you know, solar and wind, you know, you have a problem of intermittency. So we're kind of heading in California and a lot of other places towards big time investments in hydrogen, you know. So just to articulate what many of you in the room probably think is just a ploy by the fossil fuel industry to, you know, <laughs> to stay alive. And I want to say, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing, by the way, about oil companies. You know, these oil companies, we're not going to legislate them out of existence. These are massive companies with massive resources and massive influence. And I think it's better to find a path for them forward that they things they can do that are good rather than you know try to you know kill them off. That's not going to happen. And it'll, you know, that means lawsuits and legislative fights and so on. Anyway, thank you. Long answer. That's, that's a great answer. I mean, your insight, this was like amazing. Of these insights. And we're playing a big role in ITS. We're actually leading the transportation part of um, that hydrogen program for the state. Um, Lou Fulton is doing that. So I want to make sure that folks have uh, opportunities to answer questions, but also remind the folks on Zoom, if you have a question, feel free to pop it into the chat and we'll go, go back and forth to the wall. So who has questions in the room? Raise your hand if you've got questions. We've got several, actually <laughs> all on this side of the room. <laughs> you guys better, better keep your ears spinning. Isaac raised his hand the longest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. So I'm reading a book right now called Inclusive Transportation, a Manifesto for Agrarian Divided Communities. It just came out on Monday by Veronica Davis. Highly recommend everybody read it. And when you were talking about uh, autonomous vehicles, I couldn't help but think that your, your projection assumed that we're never going to solve land design and that people from poor communities will always have to drive to the, where the research rich areas are. So that's concerning me because I really hope we do figure out those land use designs that get resources to where those that are disadvantaged don't have to travel distances to get to where you need to go. Um, but on the second side, on land use, what it made me realize as well is that if you had readily available autonomous vehicles, what does that do to property values? Where suddenly people who may not live in may not live in disadvantaged communities now be, because they, they're not advantageous, go, oh, I can go live in that community now because it's cheap and I can afford it. And I can just get an autonomous vehicle to get to my work center. And so the people that had been living there through market forces will be losing their homes because the rents will go up. So those are my two concerns about the entire ideas that you postulated. Yeah, you know, the one trend I forgot to mention that you indirectly alluded 
to is remote work. And that is, you know, we were starting toward building up our doing better land use planning, more density. And now we're going in the other direction. And I mean, as a boss, I think remote work is a problem. <laughs> I just issued a, <laughs> I just issued a dictum here that I guess I said, if you're not in the office three days a week, you lose your office. <laughs> you know, I, I, <laughs> I <got it. laughs> So I've done hybrid work my whole career. So, you know, going to the very beginning. So, you know, some amount of remote work is great for people, you know, when you have challenges with kids and, you know, long commutes because you do live in some of those areas. So, some amount of remote work, you know, is clearly a good thing for many people. But it's not good for an organization, uh, for the function of an organization in terms of innovation, mentoring young people. and and so on. So anyway, I think, but it's here to stay. Um, I, I think it'll, I think the remote work is going to shrink, you know, it'll be less percentage of people, um, you know, doing remote work um, over time, just because as organizations realize how it's really, you know, destroying the organizational culture and the productivity of the organization. And that includes my former agency car, which is one of the primary uh, they really embrace this remote work. What about the land use? The land use question. Yeah, so this you know, so that so I'm saying this because it's exacerbating, not helping the land use situation. And you know. I'm not a land use expert, so I'm not going to venture exactly how this is going to play out, but it's not pretty. I don't see it getting a lot better uh, anytime soon. And so you do have, you know, these, you know, fragmented communities. You have people, you know, you know, you don't have the densities. I don't think we're going to see, I mean, we have e commerce, which is actually another force working towards. You know more diffuse more dispersion i mean that creates other problems the big warehouse problem is you know, we can talk about that you know. also that that's that's a real dj issue because it is creating i mean it's not just the pollution but it's the, the noise it's the intrusion that's a safety that you see in these uh, places that where they're building these massive warehouses and that's the e-commerce revolution as part of this so I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you, but I do think that you know what happened. Shared EV, shared automated vehicles, really are the only thing, only option I see for for, for providing high quality transportation outside of the dense areas. And I just don't see anything else happening in a in a that's major. And so, and you can do it. You can sub. We, what we should be doing is sub people that are going to use those shared rides, you know, we should subsidize it. You know, that is something that we should be doing. If you're going to share a ride, and that would be good for people that are low income that don't have other options, but it's also good to get people out of their cars. I mean, I love, I love being chauffeured. <laughs> so I don't know why so people are so much against using these. Subsidies. So I think, Greg, did you have like a sort of follow up then? Well, I, I guess, um, boy, there's so much here. Um, yeah, I'll, exactly. I'll, I'll, I know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep my comments short. Um, uh, yesterday, I attended the opening of a new apartment complex on Arden Way in Sacramento. It's a block from one of our light rail stations, 120 units, all affordable housing. So when we talk about land use, I mean, it, it can get overly complicated, but it doesn't have to be. It can be as simple as put the housing next to the light rail station. And or, or or the transit, um, the transit lines, whether it's buses or light rail or whatever, increase the density there. That that provides at least some measure of mobility for those people. Um, I want to kind of go to hydrogen. So I just comment on that. You know, yeah. Scott Weiner tried to get bills through the legislature for years to do that sort of thing, yeah. support that kind of thing, and cities oppose it, and local 
you know, nimbyism struck it down every time. Yeah, and and that's that's still a struggle. That's yeah. still a struggle. Okay, let's go. Um, and, and and let me add on to that. SACRT is actively looking to um, develop some of its surplus land adjacent to our light rail stations and lines with partners with affordable housing and and make that work. So that's that's part of it. Um, hydrogen. Um, first of all, I drive a Hyundai Nexo. Uh, I didn't take it today. My wife has it, but um, I, it, it, it's a great personal vehicle. We just need more infrastructure for it. Um, and I guess uh, the, the pushback on batteries from the RT standpoint is, and we're, we're in the process of doing some feasibility studies about this now, which of our routes can handle uh, an electric bus versus our current compressed natural gas and how many extra buses are we going to have to buy to meet the charging cycles? And, and what does that mean for our budget and for downtime and all the rest of it versus hydrogen, which is a little bit more expensive on the infrastructure side and on the vehicle side, but you fill it up in the same, roughly the same cycle time as, uh, as diesel or, or compressed natural gas. And so, I, I mean, I agree. And I forgot, I, I'm sorry, I left out buses because that is the other area where I think hydrogen it is already. I see many of the purchases of buses in California, a significant percentage of them are hydrogen buses, not, not battery buses. Yes. And so we're, we're, we're still in that uh, study phase and, and, you know, how much of which and, and of what size buses do we have? We have a couple of different sizes. Which ones are best suited for which fuel? So raise your hand if you had a question. I think we'll let's just go in order. Let's go, Eric, then Paul, then Stacey, and then Yeah, it's great to it's great to see you. We we're working on these a decade ago on a lot of this stuff. Um, you, you talk you talk really a lot on the light duty side, right? And 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 alternatives to cars and things like that, the, which results in BMT reduction, which kind of has to go part and parcel with electrification. Um, but on the heavy duty side, that's obviously a lot harder, right? And, and we've seen this explosive growth in e-commerce. Everyone loves to have you know, three clicks on your phone and tomorrow it's at your door, you know, which today, yeah, today, 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 <laughs> today, if you live in the right spot. So what do you see as strategies to try to reduce BMT in the heavy duty sector, the, the, you know, the commercial sector, which is probably a lot harder discussion or nut to crack than it is on the light duty side? Yeah, certainly the delivery side of it. We should be doing something about that. That's ridiculous. You know how many deliveries you have. You know to one house. Never mind to you know a street. You know in one day, and different trucks. And, you know it's all contracted out now anyway. So there has to be. I haven't really. We do have a professor here working on on that part of it. But I think that that is something that can and should be done. Um, you know, the broader freight system, and I don't know if you remember, Eric, but I was, I spoke up at a car board meeting uh, 2015 when the governor issued a sustainable freight action plan or executive order. And I said, yeah, you know, and everyone just talked about electrifying the truck. I said, yeah, that's good. But we should be focusing on this freight system and, you know, reducing the trucks you know, reducing the footprint and make, and, and everyone should agree to it, we'll make it more efficient and save money as well as, well, so I, they say, okay, Sperling, you think you're so smart. <laughs> uh, we want you to run, facilitate a group of people from industry and government. And we, and I did, I spent a year convening this group and at the end we accomplished almost nothing. And it's just because it's so hard. We've got so many players. You know, we sometimes say it's a system of systems. You know, you got the shipper, you got the trucks, you got the railroads, you got the ports, you got the shippers, you got the WalMarts. You know, and they themselves don't really know how to make the, system, the overall system more efficient. They're all sub optimizing. So I'm kind of, we keep talking about it. I don't know how to do it. And, and I, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Paul. Yeah, thank you. So now that you're not on the board, 
can you offer your thoughts on what California is going to have to do to keep our grid up as we go towards 100% electrification? And since we can't keep it up now, well, you know, it was under board. I'd say that's not our problem. <laughs> <laughs> We've been here the last couple of years. <laughs> it's it's a massive problem because it's you know it's in the end you don't really need that much more electricity. You know, I've seen different numbers, but it's not a massive amount of electricity. But you need it. First of all, we want it to be renewable. So that means we're phasing out some stuff, bringing in new stuff, not bringing in new transmission lines. And then, you know, especially for the trucks, you have these, you know, megawatt size, you know, stations. And so you need sub new substations built. And I know at CARB, well, here at ITS, because we work with a lot of the industry too, you know, companies like uh, Daimler and Volvo truck. They say, you know, we were getting these orders, you know, from fleets, and now they're canceling them because we're being told that we can't get the charging into our depots anytime soon, or not even getting a, a firm date, and they're canceling. And so, you know, probably the biggest challenge. So there's two big challenges. One is just the grid in terms of transmission and, and generating capacity. But then there's also the kind of the local, you know, the end of that grid is in terms of building all the transformers and substations you need you know, to make this work. And um, we're in trouble, both of those. You think we'll get there though? Because you think we'll get there with, elect with the light duty cars, but we'll get there with the grid too? I think eventually, I mean, it's kind of the same thing, right? You know, the Mary Nichols uh, adage is, you know, set an ambitious target. Yeah, you know, but you know the. We have a spot in the room. I'm curious <laughs> they, they have a perspective. Well, so, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. something we're not worried about. Right. Yeah, this, is, this is spot, and I also worked at the California ISO for about ten years. They run the grid for most of the state. Um, absolutely, there's problems and things that, that need to be dealt with. But um, from from our standpoint, as long as the charging infrastructure is two way. So that that car that's plugged in can not only draw power from the grid, but can put power into the grid when needed, that solves a lot of problems. So it's really not as much a, a question of how much electricity do you have. It's is the infrastructure well mated to the need that, that, that is changing. And um, I mean, yes, absolutely. There are places where you're going to need a whole new transformer, a whole new substation if you want to put in 25 uh, semi truck chargers. Um, there are places where you might be able to do that without a lot of extra infrastructure, but so, but honestly, the, the two-way charging is, or, or uh, two, two-way um, charging, discharging is really, really important. Vehicle to grid can actually help support the grid when, when power short. And I agree with that, but, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but it ain't going to happen in a major way for a long time. Yeah. And there's just so many reasons why, you know, it's like, for the individual car owner, first of all, you know, you got to spend more money, you know, for your house and for your car. Um, but then you got to have it connected up, you know, for it to be able to charge back. And then people are going to say, well, am I getting enough value out of this to make it worthwhile? Because, you know, maybe I'm damaging my battery. Or maybe I got to drive somewhere uh, half an hour later, but my car's empty now. Yeah, they'll, they'll have to, right? And that's, part, that's the concern. Now, in practice, there's lots of ways of dealing with that. So the theory works really well, <laughs> but in practice, partly because just of psychology of people, as well as the cost and a lot of other things, it's probably going to happen pretty slowly, I think, even though it's a great idea and it should happen. Um, Raise your hand if you have a question again. All right. I actually can have two questions. Um, All right. Yeah, one, pick one, pick one. <laughs> um, one is, are there going to be any programs to help with people like me who live in an old neighborhood? I can't, I got a, I just bought a hybrid that's 2011. It's got 145,000 miles. It only holds like 25 to 30 on a charge. There's no way to charge it where I live. There's no, it's not possible at this time with the, my house built in 1920. There's no outside outlet. There's only like three outlets in the whole house that work. It's impossible. I have to go somewhere else and charge. In Sacramento, that's hard to do. Even here, you guys only have 
Well, there's four cars and it's time to charge um, in this parking lot here. But is there going to be any kind of help for people if everybody's going to be supposed to be driving these cars? What about all the people who live in old houses and old neighborhoods that can't afford to spend $40,000 or whatever to redo their entire electrical system or whatever it takes? Now, my other question is why is there such resistance and pushback to ride sharing? I've, I've traveled all around the world and people do it everywhere else on the planet. What's, where's the pushback coming from? Is it coming from the companies or is it because people here can't handle the idea of being in a car with people they don't know? People ain't giving up their car. I'm not talking about giving up cars. I'm talking about shared Uber, shared taxis, all of that kind of stuff is done everywhere else on the planet, but not here. What's, what's the issue? Um, you know, it was happening to some extent with Lyft and Uber, you know, Lyft share, Lyft line, and Uber pool. Um, but, you know, for it to work from an, you know, from a provider, from an economic perspective, you need a density of riders, enough people using it. And Uber got pretty close to that, I think. But now it's not. And, and that's part of the challenge. So, that's why Lyft gave it up because they're losing money and the company is in bad shape. And, and so that this is a cost cutting thing. So, but there's a psychological part to it too. And I think the pandemic exacerbated that. You know, it's, yeah, we're not accustomed, you know, we don't use, I have some good anecdotes I could use, but you know, um, Californians, uh, most Californians are not accustomed to even using mass transit. Never mind, you know, the only place they share a ride is on a plane. And they do that only because there's no other good option. <laughs> yeah. and, and they can find a lot. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, we built this car based, car dependent transportation system here in this country, at California especially. You know, LA was 50,000 people in 1900. LA built up complete Sacramento, almost completely around the car. The land, and that explains the land use, it explains transit, it explains you know, almost everything. So, yeah, what about the other part though about helping people out who live in older neighborhoods yeah. where they can't charge cars at home? Because I have to go sit in a parking lot for four hours at nighttime and I keep getting kicked out because they're only for employees. There's like nowhere I can even charge my car. Well, we need a lot Seriously, more. Seriously, like, I, like they, yeah, that's yeah. right. So I've been kicked the, out like three places now because they say it's only for employees. So the state and the feds are putting a lot of money into more chargers. Uh, and we need a lot more chargers. You know, you kind of not exactly answering your question, but you'll note that the well, public chargers don't. That's kind of what you're alluding to. Not only are there not well, there many really aren't they? Not not only are there not many of them, they don't work. They don't work. work. Yeah. Well, yeah, the one, the only one that is really public right now, you have to pay for it. The co-op is broken right now. And all the other ones that I go to, like I said, eventually a security guard comes around and tells me to get out or I'm going to get towed. So all the car companies are starting to uh, convert their cars to be able to use Tesla, super, the Tesla supercharger. So GM, Ford, and Rivian all agree to uh, build their vehicles starting in another year or two to work on superchargers. And so in the US, it looks like the Tesla superchargers are, even though we've tried everything to keep that from happening. Well, I, I wanna say that, um, you know, we just opened up a big charging hub at um, Folsom right off of Highway 50. And, uh, you know, it's fast charging. Where? Um, power in and uh, off of Highway 50. It's uh, say again, the 65th Street exit. Well, where specifically? I know, I know where the highways and exits are, but where specifically are you talking it, about? It's actually at a Sacramento RT light rail station, the, the Power and Road light rail station. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And so, so this discussion just highlights the point mm -hmm. I was making before yes. about getting to that 100%. <laughs> it's going to be really hard. And so maybe a hydrogen car. So that's why a hydrogen car or a plug-in hybrid car might be the answer, you know, for, for there's, you. There's fast chargers that are so, so we have some more folks who have their hands raised. We'll go and see you around. You also- I think three. Hey, four. Um, 
I was hoping to get your thoughts on the California high speed rail. Chance of economic viability. Will it ever get constructed? Uh, cost of construction keeps going up. You know. I've worked on this project for years. So. I'm here from the high speed rail authority. Yeah, yeah. And just, just knowing we've got 10 minutes left, I know there's lots of questions. So let's make our, just try to be, be efficient with our time. Short answer is I don't know what the answer is. I, I had to testify to the legislature while I was at CARD about it. And so <coughs> the only thing I can say is well, transportation experts always said that big new technologies, you know, are too expensive, too difficult, like BART. And then they become important and successful. Um, that's the most diplomatic answer. I've about. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. Yeah, yeah, the right. majority of the conversation has been about vehicles, and I'm here to talk about bicycles. So my question to you is: um, We know from an active transportation standpoint, and doing the dollars on climate change, that a low-stress connected bicycle network is the cheapest way to get. Um, people to move around the city safely, but it always, cycling is always sort of like a faster child, if you will, it never gets the kind of energy that the conversation we just had has. I'm curious why that is from your perspective and what do we do about it? How do I re-raise the idea of e-bikes and cycling and, and uh, uh, shared, shared mobility devices besides vehicles? Because vehicles will continue to give us congestion and these other roads will not. So first of all, I agree 100%. I'm an avid bicyclist. 90% of all my trips are by bike. Um, everything, groceries. Your day is month. <laughs> groceries, everything, I do my bike. Um, but, and I have bike around the world. You know, I think part of it is, well, first of all, you know, sometimes there's bad weather. Um, but I think the biggest thing, and sometimes some people are, you know, physically people have fewer excuses now with e-bikes. Um, but, you know, the reality is Davis is an outlier because Davis is real. I feel very safe. I can ride on protected lanes almost everywhere and feel very safe. And drivers have become very sensitive to bicyclists. And so they're very cautious. That's not true hardly anywhere else. And so I ride a bike. I was just in Paris for quite a while. And even, you know, the mayor there is very anti-car and she's doing everything to get rid of cars and building bike lanes, getting rid of car lanes, but it's kind of chaotic. <laughs> and I, I don't feel real safe even in Paris where they're, I made a massive investment. There are some places I am. So say the sense of safety and security, I think is the number one thing. And so we need to invest in infrastructure where people feel safe and secure and not mixed with you know, cars. How do we get the cities and jurisdictions to see that or to do that? You know, there many of them are doing it, but slowly. You know, there is more infrastructure. I think it goes back to the lobbying the state and the feds that how much money is of that transportation money, how much should go to bike infrastructure versus everything else? And I mean, I, I mean, there's lots of local activism that can be done, and advocacy that can be done, and, and is effective. But you know, if we can use the financial lever, you know, it'll really accelerate it. So I think that's that's what I would say. Yeah, and we have champions like Supervisor Bradford in Yuba County, who you know has a vision for how this can this can be applied in his jurisdiction. I, I was going to say, you take policymakers and you show them, you show them what it can be, you show them, you get them excited about it by showing them, right? That's, that's how you accomplish that. That's been my experience. I was not passionate about any of this several years ago. And SACOG has done a great job of taking their board members on study missions and showing us transit-oriented development and mixed use and urbanism and really gotten board members excited about that because we can envision it across the board, not just in urban cores like downtown Sacramento, but in suburban areas too. And it looks a little different, but it's still, um, you know, you can have walkability and bikeability anywhere and should, right? And, and you can improve quality of life all across the region by doing that in unique ways in different parts of the region. So. Yeah, the, the 15 minute city 
you know, uh, is one concept. There's a, another good article I read called the 20 minute suburb. You know, there's, there's different kind of concepts. So raise your hand again. I think you're up. Thank you. Real quick, and thank you for your feedback. It's absolutely super info. I, I have a question related to the, the psychological or social that, that you talk about. I, I worked as a civil rights manager at USDOT, at Federal Highway Administration, before the chamber. So we know that, like we talk about low income communities and, and low income all is all relative. You live in Newport Beach, low income means you make 600,000. <laughs> when, when we look at statistics on how many people catch the bus, as we talked about before, and we know that's just one or two percent, or there's a zero in front of the decimal, and you look at most census tracts, are we doing anything from a public service announcement standpoint to? Yeah, we've lived in Europe, so we know the train comes on time in Germany, all the time, every time, everybody catches the train, you, you can rely on it, but with the reliance that we got on cars in America, especially in California, how do we convince the public that this is a viable alternative, that if you gave up your ICE car, that this car over here is, is a viable option, and you know it ain't ugly, and you still can get where you want to go. Can that kind of accelerate this change we're looking for? And how much is being done to sort of convince people that, all right, there are other cars than a Chevy Volt that you can get, no disrespect to the Volt. You know, if the president got to make me buy the car, how about just build a good car? <laughs> okay, so, but let me leave the electric vehicle or part of it to the side and say, you know, how do we reduce dependence on cars? And you can't do it politically. You can't do it overtly, let's say. Certainly not in California. You know, the mayor of Paris can get away with it because she's only the mayor of inner Paris. She's not even the mayor for the suburbs, you know, and she was mayor of the whole metropolitan area. She wouldn't be able to do it, you know, but in then. So you got it. So this is, it's a political question, really. And, how do you pull that off? So in Copenhagen, the way they did it is very quietly every year over many years, they just shrank the number of parking spaces I read about that. Yeah. and they just made it more painful, you know, people. And, but at the same time, they built the bike lanes. And so you gotta, you know, you have to subtly do something to make it more painful, but you can't do it overtly. I, you know, here I am arguing for non-transparent policy, which is completely against everything I believe. In. But, in this, but in this particular case, and then creating the, the incentives, you know, you gradually build up. You know, Davis, it took 30, 40 years yeah. to create what it has here. It didn't happen overnight. Do you think pricing has a role in that? Oh, pricing is like the number one strategy now, for sure. And that's you know, parking pricing, road pricing, congestion pricing is absolutely central to it. But again, that's political, you know, legislators get thrown out of office for advocating a 12 cent a gallon tax increase, you know. So it's a little difficult, but it's, it has to be done. You know, you have to price it. So, so we, let's, let's just get a, let's just see how, so who has questions for me? Okay, we're down to two. Let's, let's get both of them. Let's go. Okay, I'll Alberto, sure. you start you start talking. You wanna well, I was gonna say when you bring us back in two, three years, those of us that have to come across the causeway, we are going to be part of the experiment in terms of pricing and see what it does to the traffic. Right? Yeah. 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 Gary. So supervisor Brad, sorry. Gary's good. <laughs> Gary's good. Do you envision uh, that the shared automated vehicles will be decreasing the traffic congestion on our freeways? Um, and if so, is that really because of pooling opportunities and or uh, you know the technology allowing better utilization of lanes because you can pack more cars into the same lane following at a closer distance okay so this is where pricing comes in you need pricing to make this happen in the right way so you got to price it so that if you do share a ride you know you have a much lower fare than if you go alone or if you own your own automated car so we've got to figure out how to do it. And it doesn't have to be all monetary pricing in, some, in terms of parking restrictions and so on. But pricing is key. To, and, and, and if it's done, yes, it will. You know, 
some people need more mobility. You know, we talk about reduced mobility, but that 20% I was talking about, they probably could use more, you know, PM, you know, passenger miles traveled, not EMT, but passenger miles. So a little increase for some people is not a, is a, is a good thing. Overall, we can increase it substantially. And that's, you know, the goal, the scoping, you know, the CARB scoping plan, the state says, we're going to get 30% reduction in BMT per capita. There's another dream. That one, is, you know, <laughs> that one is beyond the pale. You know, that is even. Uh, I think that's when the Sierra Club ran everyone out of the building when we went to that car. <laughs> that one, that so, was ridiculous. So we have a, another sneak, sneak in question. I'll be quick. Sure. I'll be quick. You guys made me want to ask a question. So I, I work with ACE, the Lions of California Social Media Empowerment, to work with low income families and uh, people of color. Um, we have a new committee around transit and improving the transit system in Sacramento. We've surveyed over 300 people. And so the top two things is tied, like the concerns around dependability, right? People can't make it to work on time or appointments or reducing the cost, right? So like low income, affordable fares or transit. What do you think would help get more of our like families, low income families or families? Like, what do you think would be like if you had a recommendation between those two things? You know, my recommendations would be to reform the whole <laughs> finance and institutional structure of it. And so, which is politically not going to happen anytime soon. So I don't really have a, there's lots of little things, yeah. but that's why I come back to the shared ADs. I just don't see in today's world um, how to pull that off. Well, we do have a transit research center. Yes. At Davis. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Good plug. Good plug. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Let's give Dan a round of applause. Yeah. Could you give us a little hope, Dan? <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. we're, we're, you know, okay, electrification, huge success. Uh, um, the mobility part of it, I, I guess I am not very hopeful. That's why I keep going for this, you know, uh, out of the park uh, <laughs> thing, because everything else is incremental. And, you know, the bike bikes. We've done better on bikes, right? And, and it's happening here, you know, most places incrementally. More of that is good. But yeah, that's, a, that's not like you. You know, I'm an optimistic kind of guy. <laughs> that really hurts me when you. <laughs> well, well, the good news is the, the good news is that we we had a sidebar with with um, Dan's team here at ITS, and I think we're gonna maybe brainstorm about how. Clean Air Partnership folks uh, here here in the Sacramento region might be able to work more closely with ITS um, on some of these these, these issues. Uh, yeah, so sure. I should say back there, you know, Susie Pike is helping me our tran transit center, and Molly over there is working a lot on both transit and automated vehicles. <laughs> Jesus is working on all kinds of things with disadvantaged communities, low income. So and. And is Sarah anyone else here? here? Sarah McCullough. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> so, right. so leveraging leveraging the resources of the university and other institutional anchor anchor partners in, in addressing these issues. Well. And they're much more optimistic about all of this. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, well, just want to thank you guys for hosting. Um, want to thank JC, Molly, Christina Kelly. So that's the ITS team that really helped us out with organizing. I want to thank Laurel Smith, Valley Vision. Give her Laurel a round of applause. Um, and just want to thank our, you know, our contributors and all of you for, for participating today. Um, I am going to, so this was recorded, so I know we had folks on Zoom listening along. I'm sorry we didn't get to you guys, a couple of questions that came in through chat. We had really good questions here. I didn't get to my questions on the paper either, so I really enjoyed this. Um, but I, I will be sending the recording out next week, and there will be a little evaluation Google form. We always love when you guys fill out the evaluation, right? Um, and so I hope you enjoyed your Friday afternoon and just go to either valleyvision.org to follow us or its.ucdavis.edu to follow ITS's work. And thank you guys again. All right.